Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to UMBC. Happy birthday, UMBC. Give us a round of applause. Please feel free to be seated on the platform. My name is Greg Simmons. I'm the Vice President of Institutional Advancement and 2004 graduate of the Public Policy Program. Give me a hand for that. And we are here today to celebrate the achievements of this extraordinary place. Whether you were here on that first day, literally 50 years ago today, or you're a new student here, a new staff member, new member of the faculty, we're here today to reflect on the place that we've become and the place that we want to be. And so uh, we're delighted you're here, and we look forward to a wonderful program. Uh, many of you, as I look out and they're on the crowd, this is not the first part of the celebration. How many people were able to join us for our events over the weekend and for the fireworks and the symphony? Was that great? Give Michael Richards, conductor and professor of music and the orchestra, a round of applause. It was terrific, truly inspiring. They were fantastic. Before we get started, I do want to take a moment to acknowledge some very special guests that we have today. And, and as I call their name, I'll ask them to stand up and we'll hold our applause until the end if that's okay. Um, today, uh, we have Maryland State Treasurer Nancy Kopp, Speaker Pro Tem of the Maryland House of Delegates, Adrian Jones, UMBC graduate. We have uh, County Executive Kevin Kamenetz, Maryland State Senator Jim Mathias, UMBC graduate. We have uh, State Delegate Mark Chang, UMBC graduate. There's a theme here I'm starting to pick up on. <laughs> State Delegate Eric Ebersol, who's married to a UMBC graduate. <laughs> Delegate Sandy Rosenberg. Baltimore County Councilman Tom Quirk. Senator Ulysses Curry came in, and so we're delighted to see him join us today. And of course, our University of System Maryland Board of Regents Chair, Jim Brady. And anybody else who came in that I didn't see, give them a big round of applause. We're so delighted that they're here and all of the support that they've given us through the years. In a few minutes, you'll hear from Dr. Abowski and have him talk about UMBC at 50, reflections and aspirations. But first, it's my great pleasure to introduce our provost, Dr. Philip Rouse, to lead the next part of our program. Philip? Thanks, Rick. Thank you very much, Greg, and happy birthday, UMBC. The many different expressions of our UMBC community throughout this celebration have been truly wonderful. Inclusive excellence is our strength. It sparks distinctive educational experiences and rich opportunities for scholarship, civic engagement, and professional development. Inclusive excellence is also the foundation for leadership and governance on campus. Whenever we encounter a major opportunity or challenge, our well-established culture of shared governance enables us to think and plan together effectively. Our UMBC, a strategic plan for advancing excellence, recently adopted after three years of campus research and discussion, is an important example of this strength of ours. And I want to take this opportunity to thank the hundreds of you who contributed time, ideas, and thoughts to that planning process, our vision for the future of UMBC. It is now going to be my honor to welcome the leaders of each of UMBC Senates and our Alumni Association. But before they speak, I would like to ask everyone who has served as a member of the Faculty Senate, the Graduate Student Association, the Non-Exempt Staff Senate, the Professional Staff Senate, the SGA or Student Senate, or the Alumni Board, could you please stand so that we can acknowledge your service to UMBC? And now I'm delighted to invite our shared governance leaders to the podium to narrate a brief visual tour of UMBC's history. Thank you. Happy anniversary, UMBC. 
Um, from the Graduate Student Association, I am Deanna Cerquetti, President. UMBC was founded um, in one of the most hopeful and turbulent times in American history. A new university whose first students were products of a baby boom and social changes that gave many families the first chance to send a child to a university. UMBC broke ground in 1965 and Albin O. Kuhn was the founding chancellor as the university opened its doors 50 years ago today on September 19, 1966. The campus had three new buildings, Gym 1, Lecture Hall 1, and part of today's Biological Sciences building. On that day, that first day, UMBC had 760 students, 45 faculty members, 35 support staff, and 500 parking spaces. <laughs> the, the Chesapeake Bay Retriever was then chosen as the school mascot in 1967. UMBC kept innovating its, in its curriculum, holding one of the first winter sessions in the nation in 1968 and creating one of the first interdisciplinary degree programs in the country called Option 2 in 1969. The university kept growing and with the new library in 1968 and the Mathematics Psychology Building in 1969. Greetings from the Faculty Senate. I'm Matt Baker, the Vice President. As the 1970s dawned, UMBC began to forge a path from a new institution to a modern research university, creating graduate programs and finding its place in the state's higher education landscape. It wasn't always easy, but the seeds planted then by students, faculty, and staff have blossomed now. UMBC held its first commencement in May 1970, incidentally, the month I was born. <laughs> Noted ABC television anchor Howard K. Smith was the first commencement speaker. UMBC's second chancellor, Calvin B.T. Lee, arrived in 1971. The campus kept growing, with three new dormitories, a dining hall, and the Fine Arts Building, the Social Science Building, and the Administration Building, all completed by 1973. In 1976, UMBC awarded its very first PhD in the field of applied mathematics. John Dorsey became the first univer the university's third chancellor in 1977. Congratulations, UMBC, from the Nunnick Staff Senate. I am Dottie Kaplan, President. The 1980s were a time for consolidation and innovation at UMBC. The university created new programs, new spaces, and began its shift from a commuter school to a residential campus. It was also an era where the university started to let the world know the value of extraordinary research and teaching training happening inside what was called Loop Road. UMC won its first national title in intercollegiate athletics when the men's lacrosse team took home the NCAA Division II title. The university continued to blaze academic trails with the founding of one of the nation's first emergency health system services program. Michael Hooker was named the fourth chancellor of UMBC. He would also be the first president of the university after the University System of Maryland changed its designations for campus leaders. A new tradition started in 1987 when a statue of UMBC mascot, True Grit, was installed on campus. The statue's shiny nose has brought luck on exams to many UMBC alumni since that time. In the 1988, the Meyerhouse Scholars Program was founded UMBC led by example in creating one of the most innovative and influential programs in the nation for increasing diversity in STEM disciplines. Kudos UMBC. From the Professional Staff Senate, I'm Damian Doyle, President and a proud alumnus, Class of 99. The state, the nation, and the world started to hear more and more about UMBC in the 90s. Whether it was innovative curriculum, a striving for excellence, 
or even a championship UMBC chess team. UMBC in the 90s became the place where it was cool to be smart. UMBC rose higher in the world of research and teaching in engineering and technology when its College of Engineering was founded in 1992. Today it's the College of Engineering and Information Technology. In 1993, Freeman A. Rabowski was named president of UMBC. UMBC adopted the title an honors university in Maryland in 1995, reflecting the growing aspirations and prestige of the young institution. Our first undergraduate research and creative achievement day, ERCAD, demonstrated a strong link between excellence in research and undergraduate education at UMBC. UMBC launched its first capital campaign with a goal of $50 million in 1997. By the campaign's end in 2002, we had raised $66 million. We inducted the first members of the Phi Beta Kappa Honor Society in 1998. Thank you, UMBC. From the Alumni Association Board of Directors, I'm John Becker, President and Graduate of 2001. UMBC was a rising star in higher education throughout the early 2000s, in academics, social life, and athletics. It extended the lessons learned from landmark programs such as the Meyerhoff Scholars Program and the Chemistry Discovery Center across the entire university, striving to bring the benefits of educational innovation and excellence to every student on campus. The Commons was opened in 2002. On its main street, the flags of the world celebrate UMBC's diversity. The Erickson School for Aging Studies was founded in 2004. The UMBC men's swimming squad won its first America East title in 2004, starting a string of swimming and diving championships in men's and women's competition that endures to this day. In 2005, the College of Arts and Sciences divided into two new colleges, the College of Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences, and the College of Natural and Mathematical Sciences. In 2007, the women's basketball team reached its first NCAA tournament, and a year later, the men's basketball team also went to the big dance. UMBC was named the number one up-and-coming school for the first time by the editors of the US News and World Report America's Best Colleges Guide in 2009. UM! There we go. All right, from the Student Government Association, I am Bentley Corbett Wilson, President. The current decade has shown that all the grit of students, faculty, and staff in the preceding decades has blazed a path to a greater UMBC. The university is growing in its student body, its endowment, and in the achievements of its scholars. UMBC closed its second capital campaign, Exceptional by Example, in 2011. The campaign exceeded its $100 million goal by $15 million. The first phase of the university's new Performing Arts and Humanities building opened up with a ribbon cutting and campus celebration. The second phase was completed two years later. UMBC's men's soccer team reached the final four of the NCAA tournament in 2014. In 2016, for the seventh straight year, the Chronicle of Higher Education named UMBC as one of higher education's great colleges to work for. The university broke ground for its new event center and arena in 2016 that will finally bring the UMBC's commencement back to campus. And speaking of commencement, we now welcome Vice President Greg Simmons back to the podium to introduce a very, very special graduate. Thank you, Bentley. Is it fascinating to hear the timeline and the, the record of accomplishment of this campus? A wise man once told me that everything you do in your first 50 years is preparation for how you're to fulfill your destiny. And if that's the case, this campus has an extraordinary future ahead of it. And at the end of the day, really what makes a place special is the people, right? It's the human connection we share and the achievements that we, we accomplish together. And as many of you know, our first students entered the campus in 1966 and the first commencement was in 1970, but we did have one graduate before that. 
We awarded our first degree in the fall of 1968 to Robin Keller Maine, an American studies major. And Robin has traveled all the way from Texas to be with us today. Give her a warm welcome. As we, as we think about the significance of our first 50 years and the people that have made this place so special, Robin has done something wonderful. She's agreed to write a letter to the incoming class and the future students of the next 50 years to give her advice. And this letter will be included in a time capsule which our students will open in 50 years, right? 2066, feels like a long way away. I invite Robin, UMBC's first graduate, to come to the podium to read, and her letter will be accepted on behalf of graduates of the next 50 years by Vrinda Deshpande, a member of her entering freshman class. Robin? Greetings, new students of 2016. I am writing to you on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the founding of UMBC. As its first graduate, I am here to reflect upon UMBC's history and to imagine its future. I've seen UMBC's remarkable developments over the first 50 years, and in many respects, I suspect that much has remained fundamentally the same. Back in 1966, the campus was a pretty wild and woolly place. On the first day of classes in September, new students were greeted with acres of pasture for parking, much of it muddy, and miles of wooden walkways. Workers rushed to complete the finishing touches on the new campus, even as the students were rushing to avoid them on the way to class. The aura of excitement was palpable. A new school year, a new student body eager to embrace this new learning experience, and uniquely for us, a brand new campus as well. UMBC was conceived in an era of new and exciting possibilities as a bold, experimental, suburban campus. Quoting from the 1968 yearbook, Skipjack, Without traditions and the weight of rigid sanctions, the opportunities for creative expression in a uni new university are limitless. Rising to that challenge, the student body set about creating a college experience from the ground up. With just half a dozen buildings, a handful of bright and energized faculty, students began their college studies and their college lives. It's hard to believe, but waiting us on that first day was the inaugural issue of the UMBC newsletter, the newspaper, later to be known as the Retriever. Clubs and committees were formed, social events planned, and campus spirit activities initiated. Suddenly things were taking off. The cafeteria, was the hub for all those organizational efforts, since space was always at a premium. The campus library consisted of the third floor of the academic building, yes, the academic building, and housed just 20,000 volumes. Finding a place to camp out between classes was a real challenge. Students were taking on not only their classroom studies, <clears throat> but also assuming leadership roles to help guide the campus as it developed and prepared to take its place among universities of distinction. UMBC was becoming a way of life. Birthed during the turbulent era of the 1960s, UMBC struggled, as many schools did, to redefine what education really meant. At its core was engagement of both students and faculty, in studies, in creativity, in community, in political action, and in social awareness and responsibility. 
in the 50 years since those beginnings, these commitments have not diminished, but only expanded and intensified. Like many of you, I came to UMBC with only the goal of a degree. But along the way, I developed new skills in critical thinking and analytical problem solving within the context of a liberal arts education. I have become a lifelong learner and use those skills daily to meet the challenges of our complex and shifting world. In looking back over the years, UMBC has gloriously fulfilled its promise of becoming a world-class university. Its esteemed leaders have created a place where students from all backgrounds can come together and find inspiration and vision to craft their own educational experience. As UMBC students, you are introduced to a myriad of choices and opportunities as you seek to understand yourselves and the world that you are inheriting. As Albert Einstein so aptly put it, education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. And so today, I want to remind you that you are joining this institution's firmly established traditions of ex academic excellence, exceptional creativity, social commitment, community involvement, diversity, and inspiration. Be good stewards of those traditions and of this campus, your home. They are in your hands to protect and cultivate. Embrace your time here. Stay passionate, and I'm confident you will discover your own unique path into an ever brighter future. My very best wishes to you as you begin this wonderful new adventure. Respectfully, Robin Maine. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> One of the first things I learned when I visited UMBC on New Students Day is when someone greets you with a good morning or a good afternoon, you should always respond. It was that invitation of reciprocity and building bridges that solidified my decision to become part of UMBC's class of 2020. The school is always praised for its undergraduate teaching. From what I've seen so far, that's because of how much the faculty and staff cultivate connections between the past and the present to ensure a successful future. Here, regardless of whether you're a professor who's been teaching for 20 years, a transfer student, or a senior who's ready to graduate, we're all equal in the pursuit of knowledge. I'd like to thank Robin Maine for her letter to the next generation and for allowing us to have a moment where we can learn from UMBC's inspiring history and from the solid foundation that we inherit. With these lessons, I know that my class's next four years will reflect the same dedication that the first graduating class had to education and changing the world for the better. So here's to the next 50 years at UMBC, the next 50 convocations in which eager to learn freshmen like myself will be greeted by the president of the university with a good afternoon, and they will all respond uniquely with a good afternoon of their own. Thank you. You gotta make sure she gets the letter, right? You gotta put it in the time capsule. Please. Thank you, Rob, and for your words of wisdom. And Vrinda, we look forward to seeing your UMBC story unfold. So from our individual stories, a larger story starts to emerge, one of growing impact in teaching and learning, in research and civic engagement in Maryland and around the country and across the world. So please enjoy this brief presentation, which was developed by Yakov Weinstein, a student in UMBC's Imaging Research Center, and narrated by Wendy Salkind, Professor Emerita of Theater from UMBC. Thank you.
In the early 1960s, the state of Maryland recognized the need for a new university in the Baltimore region. When the campus opened its doors on September 19, 1966, students entered three new buildings on what used to be 450 acres of farmland. Lecture Hall 1, the West Wing of the Biology Building, and Gym 1, which was replaced by the Commons in 2002. Fueled by three-quarters of a billion dollars of state capital funding, UMBC has grown into a highly residential research university over its first five decades, adding core academic buildings, expanding its library, and creating new spaces for students to study, live, and play. UMBC welcomed 750 undergraduates into its first class in 1966. Today, with expanded academic programs and a growing national reputation, enrollment is almost 14,000 students, 11,000 undergraduates, and nearly 3,000 graduate students. Inclusive excellence is a core value at UMBC. We have students of all backgrounds from 48 states and more than 100 countries and are committed to the success of each one. Charged with providing quality higher education to a rapidly expanding population, UMBC's success in this vital task is easy to track. The number of bachelor's degrees UMBC awards each year has grown tenfold over 50 years, from 241 to 2,452. Our graduate degrees have grown from just two master's recipients in 1972 to about 750 master's and doctoral recipients today. UMBC now claims almost 70,000 proud alumni who have taken the rich liberal arts education they have received out into the world to make their mark in fields ranging from the arts, public policy, law, medicine, teaching, and social work, to science, engineering, and business. The expansion of UMBC's academic programs is another clear sign of growth and impact. The number of undergraduate majors has grown from under 20 at our 10th anniversary to 55 today. Our master's programs have grown from 7 to 41. Our doctoral programs have grown from just 1 to 24. We also offer graduate certificates and a training center which offers continuing professional education. This growth has always been accompanied by a strong desire to ensure student success through innovations in the classroom, strong connections to employers, and deep civic engagement. UMBC has matured as a research university one of just four in Maryland, with annual research expenditures moving toward $80 million, supported by a wide variety of government agencies, businesses, foundations, and philanthropic institutions. The growth of UMBC has required an expansion of resources to support its mission. Since 1991, our operating budget has quadrupled from just under $100 million to almost $440 million for this fiscal year. UMBC has also made significant strides in raising its own resources to support the mission. Successful capital campaigns over the past two decades have helped the university's endowment grow in value, from about $1 million in the early 1990s to $75 million today. The funds available from our operating budget and endowment allow UMBC to make key investments in student success, teaching and learning, financial aid, academic programs, faculty and staff, and the infrastructure to support the university's mission. The impact of UMBC's growth over the past 50 years extends well beyond the campus itself. Alumni have a broad range of impact, but students do not wait to make a difference in the world. While they are still in school, they join UMBC faculty and staff in research and service efforts to help address the needs of communities that are our neighbors. UMBC's Imaging Research Center is beginning to map this vast array of efforts, starting with those in Baltimore City. Over 50 years, the founding generation, through grit and innovation, has built a research university that is now a model for others. With this strong foundation, 
we build toward the future. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the longest serving president of UMBC, Freeman Rabowski III. Thank you very much. So, so, thank, you. thank you very much. As my mother would say, you messed me up from the beginning with your, with your goodwill. This is such a special day. Good afternoon. Good afternoon again. <laughs> Welcome to our alumni and students and faculty and staff and friends, elected officials, our chair of the board of regents. This is such a special moment. I invite you to read Professor Lanou's new book, Improbable Excellence, the Saga of UMBC. It is an amazing historical analysis that describes what we heard today and goes into greater depth and makes a number of suggestions as we think about who we will be in the future. Amazingly, in 1963, the Maryland General Assembly authorized a new campus in Baltimore County. And then three years later, that visionary, Alvin O'Coon, was the, his title was Vice President for Baltimore Campuses of the University of Maryland and he was over both UMB and UMBC. He later became the chancellor of this campus, and he called this day one of the most satisfying of his experience. He said, it worked. We opened on the day we were supposed to, right on schedule. Buildings were ready to be occupied. Sidewalks were installed. The faculty was here. There were blackboards and even chalk. Now, I wonder if my students know what chalk is these days, or somehow. And so this is a time to reflect on where we've been, who we are now, and who we are wanting to become. In 1940, I want to give you some national context. In 1940, on the brink of World War II, just slightly under 5% of Americans had a degree under 5% 5, 5 of whites, 1% of blacks. At that time, we were just talking about those two groups. And most of the prestigious universities in the world were actually located in Europe, only a handful in America. And the federal government had not gotten involved in higher education. But after World War II, things changed dramatically. And in a decade after World War II, the GI Bill provided opportunities for a number of people to go to college, so much so that by 1950, we were up to 6%. And then in the mid-60s, when UMBC was founded, we were up to 10%. It was about 11% of whites and not quite 3% of blacks. And then we had Sputnik and the National Defense Act in 1958. And then we had all kinds of legislation from the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Higher Education Act of 1965, the Pell Grant program came in 1972 so that people who were not from wealthy families could imagine the possibility of their children going to college. Interestingly enough, between then and now, we have moved from under 10%, 9.8 precisely, percent of Americans with a college degree to a slightly over 30 percent. And it is broken down this way, about 33 percent of whites, about 20, slightly over 20 percent of blacks. The fastest growing group, Hispanics, only about 15 percent. The Asian population, about 53 percent. And Native Americans, significantly below any of those groups. UMBC was the first campus in our state, the only one actually founded for people of all races. And from the beginning, people of all races did come here. At the same time, on the parallel track, federal, the federal government began doing a lot to support research that would address the needs of our society, particularly in defense, all the way over to healthcare. And we, we had the new national agencies of all types. So that, as Clark Kerr has said, we went from 20 research universities in the 1960s 
which actually were controlling well over half of all federal research, just 20, to over 100 by 2000. And with our now more than $80 million in training and research grants, we are solidly listed as one of those research universities with the particular quality of, of focusing on that liberal arts undergrad education. As a nation, though, with all the progress that we've made, it is so important that our students, our colleagues, elected officials appreciate the fact that we have so much work to do. Not quite 60% of all the students who start college actually graduate. There are tens of millions of Americans who began college and never graduated and need our support to complete degrees, two and four year degrees, so that they can have a better job and a better life for their families. Equally important and perhaps even more significant, while well over half of those in the top quartile of Americans of any race actually have completed college by the age 24. When we look at those in the lowest income quartile, that bottom 25%, under 10% of any race, under 10% are going to college and graduating. We take great pride in focusing on both those issues. How do we help more students who come to college to succeed? And number two, how do we help more students who are in the bottom quartile? All of you who are students know that I always say, look at the student to your left and look at the student to your right. Years ago, everybody said, one of you will not graduate. Now today, follow my instructions. Look at the student to your left, again. Look at the student to your right. Our goal is to make sure all three of you graduate and we don't plan to fail. Big round of applause for the self-fulfilling prophecy. And so when we think about all of the other leaders, from, from Alvin Kuhn, that visionary, to Calvin Lee, to Louis Kaplan, who was the second and the interim chancellor, to John Dorsey, and then to my beloved Michael Hooker, what we see would be leaders who are working to build a model research university with faculty and staff committed to that cause. At my installation in 1963, I remarked at the founding of Stanford University at its 25th anniversary, when they said that no one could have imagined that they would have come as far as they did. And yet, because of the Cold War and the tech boom in Silicon Valley, Stanford was already moving to become one of the best universities in the country and today rivals the oldest Harvard University as the very best in our society. It is significant that today, unlike what we might have imagined, we are on the list of the most innovative universities in the country with Stanford and MIT. Give us a big round of applause for being on that list. Those of you who graduated before a certain time know that at first we were a commuter institution. Speaker Pro Tem came across the, the ground, across the mud coming here, quite frankly, and others who came, it was very significant very significant that most people were not living on campus. Today, in the mid-80s, we've become something very different. We are a residential research university uh, and a focus on bringing students from around the world. But I want the elected officials to know the majority of our students are still Maryland residents. And we thank both the legislature and the citizens of Maryland for building this university. Give them a round of applause, please. As a member of the University System of Maryland and with the Board of Regents and our Chancellor, we have just completed both a self-study for our upcoming Middle States visit and our strategic plan that we're beginning to implement. And so many of my comments that you'll find in my actual speech that will be on the web can be found in those two documents. It is significant that since 2000, when we look at the support from the legislature, that we can say at this point that we will have had three quarters of a billion dollars in state-of-the-art facilities. I want to thank again the legislature, beginning with that speaker pro tem, our alum, and all the others. Give them another round of applause for three quarters of a billion dollars.
Our reflections in the Middle States report, and we say today, really show that we believe in being honest with ourselves, whether it's in developing a systematic, integrated approach to analytics so we can help more students, knowing that while we help many students to succeed, we still have some falling through the cracks. We can be better. What's the line we always use? Success is never final. Remember that, very important. And we readily admit that while we have rich diversity on the campus and a lot of national acclaim, that we must increase diversity in the faculty for African Americans, for Hispanics, for women in certain areas. Give me a round of applause for the idea of increasing diversity in the faculty and staff. Very important. Very important. And so today we have these new students who came in this year, 2,800 of them. We talk about the total student body. We talk about a 24% increase just in the past five years. We will be increasing the enrollment as we can attract more resources to hire more faculty and staff. It is very encouraging that the recent legislation calls for multi-year increases to the base that can help us with our funding guideline issue. Give the regions and the board and the, and the legislators a hand for giving us that money this year coming up. <laughs> We're looking forward to talking to them about that. Very important. At the same time, it is significant that we have increased substantially our work with other countries, our work with other universities, and I will talk about both. But I am especially proud that we have our, our largest retention rate ever. 87% of our freshmen return this year. When looking at our graduation rate, we are well above 60%. We have 67% graduating from UMBC or another four-year four institution in Maryland. But when we look at those around the country who graduated just from the class of 2009, we can tell you that 75% have earned a post-secondary degree, and we can identify 15 additional percent who are still enrolled. So we can say that we have 90% successful. We'll keep working on the other 10%, but it's a big deal that we can talk about the fact that this year we had 100 more degrees awarded than ever before, and, and we will continue to work on that. We have solidly placed now among research universities as a doctoral university with higher research. What many people may not know is that by the 80s, we were, at the end of the 80s, we only had $4 million in research. Now, what we did have was far more research going on in the social sciences and public policy. In fact, we were in the top 20 institutions per faculty member in research according to a study by Hugh Graham focusing on broad social sciences and policy, but we were just building the research dollars. And at the end of the 80s, we only had $4 million. By the end of the 90s, we only had $22 million. We were still very small in research in terms of STEM areas. We had great strength in the arts, humanities, and social sciences, but still working to build in all those areas. And now, as, as of today, we have quadrupled that amount to $82 million. Uh, it is important to recognize the role we play in this state with public policy, that we're talking about focusing on issues of the environment, of health, of national security, of education. Uh, I recently heard PhDs in public policy from uh, recent years and, and this past week, and there were people who were now heads of national corporations, of, of a multinational corporation, all the way over to uh, someone who is the Deputy Surgeon General in our country, and she now is an admiral. Give us a hand for producing a woman admiral. Big deal. <laughs> we now have added to the first scholars program that you've already heard about, and we now have programs, the Sunheim Public Affairs Program. We have the Humanities Scholars, the Linehan Artist Scholars, the Sherman STEM Scholars for math and science teachers going into Baltimore City and surrounding areas in challenging schools, the Seawit Scholars, uh, and a, an endowed Humanities Center. And all of those are leaders. And the key is we're working to give students in general the kinds of experiences that our scholars have. When I think about what we need to do to improve academic achievement in our country, nothing would be more important than K through 12. 
than working with pre-K through 12 to make sure they can do well. And so today we talk about a budget that's 440 million, presidentially speaking, moving towards a half billion. You get that? 440 million. We'll keep adding to that number. And an endowment that's over 75 million. But when we look at current market conditions, under current market conditions, our gifts already in place and pledges by 2020 already we reach $100 million. Big round of applause for going from $1 million to $100 million. And so we are in the quiet phase of the, of the campaign and we'll be a lunch, uh, talking about a, a recent gift of $6 million we're very pleased to get. Uh, and I want to, you know, and, and we'll talk about that very soon. But in the meantime, we will be launching our public campaign for $150 million in the spring, and we're already halfway there. In terms of research, let me give you two examples. Uh, Mike Summers just went into the National Academy of Sciences. Huge deal. Give him a big round of applause for that. There are many research universities still working to get there first. And one of his postdocs and PhD students just became full professor of biochemistry at Harvard. Another big round of applause for Victoria. <laughs> and there's so many suggestions of people to, to talk about in the arts, humanities, and social sciences. Just one example, Kate Brown, professor of history, has won seven prestigious awards for her book, Plutopia. And she's recently been named an Andrew Carnegie Fellow and a Broadell Fellow at the European University Institute and a fellowship at the American Academy in Berlin. Give her, Kate, a round of applause for you. <laughs> this year long, we have faculty who've won prestigious fellowships in Italy and France and Sweden and UK and Germany and other places. It is very important to think about the faculty research connected to that undergrad experience in a liberal arts college environment focused on research across the board, with undergrads doing a lot of research and grad students. We now have 70,000 alumni, big deal. And every year, two to 3,000 more. We have people who are the Baltimore County Teacher of the Year, the Howard County Teacher of the Year this year. We've got people who are lawyers and doctors and scientists and humanists and artists and public officials. Um, and, and it's very interesting. I was walking in with a, one, of the, one of the senators, and he's a parent, but he was also the mayor. <laughs> he was the mayor of Ocean City, and he's now said, give Jim Mathias a round of applause, would you please? <laughs> but many delegates in the room and senators who have been helping us tremendously across the board. But this year, we have the president of the American Institute of CPAs, the chair of the Greater Baltimore Committee, the deputy surgeon general that I mentioned, the speaker pro tem, and we are with uh, over 1,000 graduates at NSA, over 2,000 graduates who are uh, at the, in the Navy right now. We launched Navy ROTC this year. Big deal, first in the state, Navy ROTC. The head of the president of Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, the president of Clemson University, and many others are our graduates. So we are very proud of our alumni, and we are working to have many more come back to this campus. And so here are the big questions. Uh, how, how can we increase our success with degree completion? What are the things we need to do? How do we work more effectively, even with K-12? How do we decide what size enrollment we will get based on the amount of resources we have? How can we provide as much experiential learning and greater cultural and global competence for our students? How do we deepen what we're doing with innovation and teaching and learning? And how do we invest in faculty and staff to give them the support they need for multidisciplinary research, scholarship, and creative activity? In all those, and how do we work with our graduates? to make sure they get gainful employment, both at the undergrad level and the grad level. Some of you know that I say to the parents of, of, of undergraduates, if your son or daughter listens to our advice, we guarantee you they will not have to come home and live with you after they graduate. Give me a big hand for that, for that statement. It's big. We will continue to build partnerships from the work we do with UMB, which is perhaps our strongest partner with the seed grants and the MD-PhD programs and the shuttle going back and forth. But some of you don't know, we have really major partnerships with College Park. We've got with the MITRE Corporation and cybersecurity, we actually are part of a $5 billion grant. 
Now, we get a small percentage, but a small percentage of $5 billion is a big deal. Um, but we also have a, uh, another grant in the Center for Research and Exploration in Space Technology and, and with College Park that's worth well over $100 million going for another one right now. And most recently, we, we, were, we, we received a very prestigious national endowment for the Humanities Grant between UMBC and College Park focusing on issues of race in America. And we will be having the first panel discussion with the presidents of College Park and UMBC here in our city, focusing on solving the problems that are important. And so whether we're talking about work with those two research universities or with the University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science, go down to IMET and see what we're doing with them down in marine biotechnology, focusing on the Chesapeake Bay and those kinds of efforts to what we're doing with Bowie State in cybersecurity or what we do with University of Maryland Eastern Shore for producing scientists. The idea is how do we build synergy among the University of System of Maryland campuses in such a way that the state sees all of us working collectively together. And so we will be expanding our model for at the national level for work that focuses on helping students succeed. You will see more and more about what we do in intelligence, defense, healthcare, dealing with the health disparities in our society with the achievement gap, the academic achievement gap. You know, we take great pride in the success of recent publications. Perhaps the best article yet on UMBC was this weekend's New York Times. A big round of applause for the article this weekend, if you can. Millions of people are reading that article right now. And we are working on uh, looking at what, what the National Academy of Sciences says about the role of, of future research universities in helping with society. With the National Academy of Engineering, we've taken on, embraced the grand challenges that they talk about. Uh, and when the Freddie Gray death occurred, we looked in the mirror to assess what we as a campus could do to reach out to Baltimore City and beyond to talk about the critical issues of inequality, of race, of, of misunderstandings among people, and to challenge ourselves to roll up our sleeves as faculty, as staff, as students, and get involved. And so I, I'm delighted that we right now have over 140 programs and initiatives, partnerships, and organizations with our colleagues, with our students, focused on this city and its residents. And there's an energy that says we will be doing more and more to focus on social justice, on equality, on racial issues, and on teaching people how to talk across differences, to listen to others, and to have the very difficult conversations that America has not learned how to have. We want to be a national model. Give us a big round for being a national model in that area. And then in economic development, we now have the research park that has over $300 million uh, coming out of that, plus another $150 million, altogether about $5 million from $500 million from salaries at about $150 million to what we're doing in terms of products and processes, another $350. Uh, with 130 companies there, including women, minorities, people of all types who are CEOs, and working very closely in cybersecurity with places like North of Grumman and the National Security Agency. Uh, but when you think about how well we're doing, just look at the Maryland Innovation Initiative in the last round of, with nine awards given to the research universities, public and private, four of those nine went to UMBC faculty. Big round of applause for what we do. And so as I close, over the past 50 years as a nation, we have grown in higher education in our country with more people than ever completing college degrees, with many more needing to do so. And our campus has been a part of all of that. This has been a 50-year experiment in Cadenceville. Can you bring people together from all races, from all backgrounds, all religions, and have them learning how to work together, to live together, to listen to each other? And that's what we're in the process of doing in our country, and it's what we believe we are doing on this campus and will do even more of in the time to come. And so we are forward-looking and responsive. We have a strong focus on inclusive excellence. We believe in high expectations and a passion for learning. And most important, we still believe in hard work. I will continue to quote Aristotle. 
excellence is never an accident. It is the result of high intention, sincere effort, and intelligent execution. It represents the wisest option among many choices. And then he said, choice, not chance, determines destiny. It takes grit to achieve greatness. Thank you all and happy birthday. <laughs> I never would have thought six months ago that that was what we'd be doing after all of these things. Listen, it's been a wonderful day. It's been a wonderful start to this, this year of 50th anniversary celebrations. And whether you're a public official or a parent or both, whether you are uh, a retired professor, a member of the Fab Four, or and entering freshmen, you all know one thing, that this is a special community. We've come so far in such a short amount of time, and we know there's a lot of really good work to do. And we can't think of any better group of people to do it with than this group of people in this community. Give yourselves one more round of applause. There will be dozens of activities and events throughout the year celebrating this community and, and activating our alumni and doing for more work in this, in this regard. But today, I think we need to celebrate um, with a good round of happy birthday. After we sing the song, you can enter through, exit through the recreational doors where there's a lunch available to you. Again, we are deeply, deeply appreciative of you all being here. Dr. Abowski? Kisses. <laughs> 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 